All How right. did they do? All right, we're gonna get we're gonna get going because um, I know that we have about an hour, maybe a little bit more. So I wanted to say good evening and thank you to folks who are joining us. Um, this forum is sponsored by the Shaker Heights chapter of the League of Women Voters. I'm Rachel DeSell, and I'm going to moderate the conversation tonight about how the pandemic is affecting critical nonprofits that deliver services to some of Cleveland's most vulnerable residents. And we have some nonprofits represented here tonight, but we know that there are many, many others that are delivering food and healthcare and other needed support to the community. So if you're listening tonight and you're involved with one of those other nonprofits, please feel free to speak up in the chat um, and we'll try to include your perspective in the conversation. Um, and if you know other agencies that, and you need them to, you wanna weigh in on their behalf, please feel free and we'll try to get to it. Uh, tonight, we're gonna try to talk about some of the immediate changes that organizations had to make um, to keep their doors open and to keep providing really important services in the community, um, doing so virtually and also what the future holds, you know, at least as much um, of that as we can discuss with the uncertainty that we have all been living with around COVID-19 and the uncertainty that remains with the virus, um, what will happen once the community opens up. So I'm really excited. Joining me tonight are um, Emily Campbell. She's the Associate Director for the Center for Community Solutions, um, a place that I often would go to to talk to people that had expertise when I was writing stories some of the smartest folks in town. Um, Melissa Graves, the CEO of the Domestic Violence and Child Advocacy Center. Um, they've been doing a ton of work to juggle um, some of the issues that have come up with COVID-19 that have kept people in their homes and made it more difficult to access services. Sandra Miller, president and CEO of the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center, which has also continued to deliver services and find new and different ways to, to reach clients during this time and Cynthia Reese, the Executive Director of Greater Cleveland Community Shares, who's trying to help many, many organizations figure out their way forward um, in terms of supporting their work and supporting the community. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to hear from everybody. And um, I'll ask some questions, but uh, again, folks who are listening in, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. And those of you on the panel, if you have a burning question, please also jump in. Um, Melissa, I was going to kind of start with you to see if you could tell us a little bit about um, some of the immediate decisions you had to make about how you would continue to provide services, uh, especially in cases when those services would usually be provided in person and people were, were not um, any longer able to come to the agency. Yeah, so I mean, I just want to harken back to that week in March when, uh, when COVID happened, which now feels like a year ago, but when we had our first cases here in Cuyahoga, it was not, it was that week of March, um, that midweek in March. Remember, there was the Bernie rally and the Biden rally, and everyone was wondering what was going to happen, and they ended up being canceled, and our annual luncheon actually was that Friday. I'm not a superstitious person, but I will never again schedule an event for Friday the 13th. But as some of you may have been planning to come and we were going to unveil our new name and logo and then everything, you know, plans changed on a dime. So we knew it was the right decision to cancel that event. And we also knew that we had to pivot quickly because we knew what a stay at home order was going to mean for people who are experiencing abuse in the home. You know, you've got uncertainty, which abusers don't like uncertainty. They tend to assert control when there's uncertainty. Uh, there's financial questions and insecurity, and now you've got people isolated at home 24-7 with an abuser, children and adults. So we knew that it was going to be a really volatile and dangerous situation. So we pivoted very quickly and kept a lot of our critical services open. So we have a shelter for domestic violence victims, our helpline, uh, Canopy, we're a partner with Chan Canopy Child Advocacy Center, as is CRCC. So, you know, those we knew we had to keep going immediately um, and pivoted pretty quickly. And what we found was that in the wake of trying to move quickly to doing remote services, because we told staff to work from home as much as they could if they weren't in a residential setting, it kind of forced us to do some things that we had been moving toward, but it pushed us off the ledge, right? So telehealth, doing therapy, doing advocacy, working with clients remotely, was something that we'd been planning to do, but we hadn't really fully transitioned. So this forced us to do it, virtual training, webinars, 
you know, we jumped right off the ledge on that to more quickly and it's been really well received and important right now. People really are curious about what's happening in domestic violence and child abuse. And then with the shelter, expediting permanent housing. Like we had to reduce our census at shelter in order to be able to provide some level of social distancing. So if we're, but there's still people who need shelter. So in order to still have room for people, we are having to really expedite permanent housing, which has been a shift in model for us, but it's been one that we've, wanting to move, we've been wanting to move toward anyway, because permanent housing is a better solution for victims than shelter. So that's just a, a brief snapshot of some of the immediate pivots that we had to make. Sure. I'm, I'm sure we can get kind of more into that. And I, I think that we're going to be hearing the word pivot a lot tonight. It's something that that so many agencies had to do and do quickly and also without a lot of information. And mm -hmm. Emily, I know that the Center for Community Solutions did a survey um, to try to figure out what this disruption um, was doing, um, was what problems it was causing for agencies, how they were dealing with it. And I know that you came kind of prepared to share a little bit of what you heard. And maybe if you could just first preface that with what types of agencies you surveyed, um, what kind of work they do, and how many you heard from? Sure, absolutely. I'd, I'd be glad to. Um, thanks for having me today, and thanks to all those that are tuning in here on this beautiful evening in Northeast Ohio. So the Center for Community Solutions, our mission is to improve health, social, and economic conditions, and we do that through applied research and public policy and um, spend a lot of our time thinking about needs in communities and how do you quantify those and, and kind of looking at data. And so we had started to hear, as I'm sure everyone else has and has experienced, all these stories coming out about what nonprofit service providers were doing, what government, local government was doing to try and continue to provide services in the midst of all this disruption. And so what we really wanted to do was turn that anecdote into data. And the way you do that is through a survey and to, to get a sense of are the stories we're hearing, you know, across the board, are they pockets of things, you know, both good and bad. And so we did conduct an online survey, 734 groups across the state of Ohio uh, responded to the survey over the course of two weeks in late April. The dates that it happened are really important because it's you know, right in the midst of things before really anything started to open up again. And we wanted to kind of capture the snapshot in time and hear, hear what groups are doing. Um, as I mentioned, it covers all 88 counties of Ohio, but heavily um, kind of the core of the responses came from Northeast Ohio and especially Cuyahoga County, where um, Community Solutions has the deepest reach. And so I'm gonna share my screen here and share a couple of quick slides. There we go. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we asked is, is at this point in time, what level of disruption is COVID-19 and or the stay at home order having on your agency? And we thought it was important to ask about those two things together, right? Because what we're seeing and what we all know is it's not just the virus, it's the response to the virus as well. Um, and some of those choices that's really causing the disruption. And as you can see here, more, um, you know, most agencies are experiencing some disruption. 34% um, have said that it's significant disruption, but they expect to bounce back quickly after things settle. We're most concerned about this 20% of responses that said that they experienced significant disruption and they expect the return to services to be difficult. Um, you know, these are the, these are the groups that have faced some real challenges over the course of the last two months. You know, some of the other things we asked and, and we heard about is um, how are agencies adapting? And it should come as no surprise that over 75% of agencies that responded said that they've made at least one adjustment. And the vast majority of those are delivering services by phone or delivering services by video chat service. Um, we found that phone was a little more common for smaller agencies. Video chat was more common for the the larger agencies, and I should say that these groups um, most provide direct services. They really run the gamut in type of services provided. We got answers from um, agencies that employ less than five people and agencies that provide over 500. So really the depth and breadth of um, the service provision community in Ohio. 
And just one other thing that I, I wanted have, to- I have a question yeah. real quick. Um, so of the 20% of folks that, that really expect the return to services to be difficult, did those all fall into certain buckets? Were they, you know, direct service agencies that provided kind of basic needs? Were they agencies that provided kind of more ancillary services or is it kind of a mixed bag? Yeah, it's really a mixed bag. Um, in some of the open-ended questions, it seemed that, of course, the agencies that were providing services through the schools or in conjunction with schools were facing a really difficult time because their whole service model had been immediately upended. Um, and, you know, so that was something that we saw. You know, a lot of the, um, the emergency service serving agencies, you know, the food banks, the food pantries, the people providing emergency assistance, they haven't stopped. <laughs> I mean, just like um, those who, who were on the panel today. And so, you know, it's a shift in service, but in some cases they're serving even more people than they were in the past. Thank you. And so I think if we look very quickly at this next slide, um, we can see some of that. So just a quick, you know, about how the slide is set up. Red shows increase, you know, the dark red is increased, the lighter red is an increase anticipated, the gray is no change, and the blue is either a decrease anticipated or it has already decreased. And so you can see here that more than half of respondents reported that they had either experienced or expect to experience an increase in demand for services. Um, similarly, almost half said that they have an increase in expenses. In the open-ended questions, we heard a lot about expenses relating to masks and hand sanitizer and wipes and the kinds of things that are needed to continue to keep clients safe. Um, and, you know, I was interested to see that that fewer said that they've already experienced a decrease in funds, either through government funds or philanthropic funds, something that I think we're concerned about over the long term. And so, you know, this is what we heard from this um, rather robust group of nonprofit organizations and government agencies across Ohio. And I'm sure many of the experiences are paralleled um, on those on the panel here tonight. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and I see that we have some questions coming in and I'm going to try to get to some of those. Um, but first I wanted to ask, um, you know, Sandra, if you could talk just a little bit about Cleveland Rape Crisis Center and maybe some of the, the pivots that, that it had to make that we might not consider, um, you know, when this, this disruption came in and people maybe couldn't come um, for regular visits or also, you know, Cleveland Rape Crisis Center provides um, emergency room, you know, support for survivors of sexual assault. And, and I don't know how, how that changed and how you guys kind of figured out what you could do and, and what you couldn't provide any longer, if, if, if there was anything. Sure, yes. So uh, I have to admit that um, at the beginning of this year, um, you know, we present goals to the board, propose agency goals to the board. And um, the feedback I got from the board at the beginning of the year was you need to add a goal about uh, telehealth and making your services available via telehealth. And I have to be really honest with you that I kind of rolled my eyes and thought, oh my gosh, one more thing we have to do this year. Like, how can we try to do any more than we already are? But um, I, my board chair who had the foresight to, to nudge me in this direction, I'm really grateful to him because we had taken a number of steps already to prepare for telehealth. So when the stay at home order went into effect, it was, um, it was an easier transition for us, made easier by the fact that they essentially relaxed so many of the state regulations uh, surrounding telehealth. But we already had done the research on the technology and confidentiality and so forth. So um, that, that was, and, and we found um, staff and clients who started out being a little bit resistant to it, um, came to really enjoy it and feel like, for some, that it was even a better experience. I mean, for us, it's not for everyone, and, and some chose not to participate for sure. Um, with regards to the hospital advocacy, it was it was a very scary time in the middle of March, um, and the hospital emergency rooms they were obviously preparing for a lot of other things, and we got a lot of mixed reactions from the hospitals. Some who said, "No way, we don't want advocates in the room." You know, others who were even unresponsive because they had other priorities. So. 
um, we opted um, to make our services available via telehealth only. And, and some of the nurses switched quickly with that and others um, ran into obstacles. And, and I think there's some opportunity for that telehealth to continue in the future, especially in parts of our state where they do not have 24 hour sexual assault nurse examiner units. Um, Ashtabula County is in our service area, for example, and they don't have the same resources. And, and so I see telehealth kind of being woven into what the future could look like there. Um, but there's, there's also nothing that replaces that human contact, um, which is so important when somebody's in the immediate aftermath of a trauma. And I'm interested, um, Melissa and Sandra, um, you know, the transition to telehealth in terms of staff being um, equipped and knowing how to how to use the services is one thing, but when you're serving vulnerable populations and we have a city, especially, you know, the city of Cleveland proper and, and even some of the outlying areas that, that don't have regular access to internet, might not have devices that are that are suitable for some of those different platforms. Um, how, how was that to negotiate and, and how are you still negotiating? I don't know if things are changing and I've seen a lot of folks putting in grant requests for devices that they can share with clients. So I'd like to hear a little bit about how that's, how that's going for, for you guys. Um, I'll start. We, um, um, most of our clients did have the ability to interface and it's been um, interesting, you know, especially with the DV, if people run out for an errand, you know, and they go to the grocery store, we have clients who are sitting in the parking lot at the grocery store doing a therapy session. And, you know, that's the only time they can get out of the house. Um, we have done quite a bit of donations of burner phones. We've just bought the little disposable burner phones that we can get to folks. Sometimes we'll even give them a, a card with the minutes on it so that they can access us and kind of hide that phone. Their own personal phone might not be safe. Um, we've also been doing proposal requests to do tablets, smaller tablets, so that you know the kids who are in shelter or kids who are um, not at home, they could do virtual school. And that if we did have people who were offsite, not in the shelter, that our staff could remotely connect with them. And that some of our court advocates, you know, if they had clients who they really needed to connect with, they could give them a tablet and have that contact with them. Yeah, and, and I think connectivity is a huge issue. And even um, it, it just the, the income inequities that we had before this started were just exacerbated. Um, by an nth degree through all of this. So even though we were only offering telehealth services for some period of time, it was obvious that that was not going to work for everyone. So we've been working to try to reopen offices and, you know, and conduct therapy when you have um, two people in a, in a closed office, um, trying to stay six feet apart, wearing masks, you can't see each other's faces. So we've been experimenting with the sneeze guards and clear masks and face shields and trying all different combinations of things to make it tra a trauma-informed service um, that is somewhat resembles safe, warm, nurturing, um, all the things that uh, CRCC is known for. It has, it's not been easy. Thank yeah. you. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I think um, there's Robert um, Schwartz, who's in the chat asking about the kind of financial challenges and, and how agencies have started to address those. and. Um, I think we can probably hear from everybody, but Cynthia, I'm guessing that you probably immediately started hearing from agencies that you partner with and that you serve about how they would continue to do the, the really vital fundraising um, that they need to, to keep um, staff in place and to, and to do services. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious how that conversation went um, and, and what you guys have kind of figured out. Thanks. Um we did get a lot of calls <laughs> and we got a lot of questions. Um, most of our, we, in, we have 40 different members and several of them are performing arts groups. We have CPT, Near West Theater, City Music. It happened right before City Music's free concerts. Um, and I remember having a conversation with them saying, we have funding for this. How are we going? We had to cancel. What are we going to do? What are we going to tell the funder? Um, a lot of anxiety over what are they going to do about uh, canceled events and plans in the future that at, you know, way back, <laughs> way back in March, which seems a million years ago, um, 
we didn't know. And so now several of them have, um, I did a quick survey of some of our members and many of them have gotten PPP loans. Um, but now they're asking, you know, okay, this was a two month solution to a 12 month problem. And so what are they going to do beyond that? And I think that really is the ultimate question. I was surprised to also learn that many of them have cash reserves in place. And I think for the organizations that already do have cash reserves, that already have fundraising teams in place that are in good communication with their donors and can do that and can keep that communication up, they've done, they've done relatively well and they've been a, able to apply for grants. I know that Northeast Ohio Coalition for the Homeless has just, they've leaped out, leapt out into um, so many different things and um, their advocacy, our members work on grassroots advocacy and organizing as well as the direct um, service and response. And they're an example of that. They had to work with the city and the county and try to help get the shelters um, cleared out a little bit so that there was, there was proper distancing. There were, um, uh, people that were um, unsheltered that really needed help. So um, they were able to really attract some of the funding right from the start that they needed. I think um, what we're going to see in another couple months and next year, how things shake down, how we're able to respond. I think fundraising is definitely going to be different. Um, I was looking at some statistics earlier about direct mail and I'm getting a lot of direct mail and I'm sure everybody is and we love getting direct mail, right? Um, but some organizations are sitting it out and they shouldn't be because response rates are way up. Um, they have, they're a two year um, high right now. So people are really responding. And I have to say that Clevelanders have really responded. The foundations have really responded. Um, and so we are a generous community. And that has been really exciting and impressive to watch. Um, and I would say in general, all of our members have really stepped up to the challenge and been able to really respond. And um, the philanthropic community has responded in, in turn. So yeah, it's been reassuring. It's a good story. Yeah, I was wondering too about some of the smaller um, organizations, because as I just kind of watch what's going on in the community with, with all the time I have to do that now, um, I noticed that some of the arts organizations, even though they're maybe smaller and their funding isn't as, as large in general, they've been very nimble. And I've mm -hmm. seen, you know, the CPTs and Cleveland Playhouse and other folks just delivering amazing arts program virtually. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. they're kind of heads above some, you know, even established places that are trying, you know, they're maybe bigger machines. It seems harder to make decisions and harder mm -hmm. to equip everybody. They've just gone out there and used all their creativity, especially to serve young people and keep them connected and engaged. It's been um, amazing. You're absolutely right. I mean, they, the, our arts groups and especially our members have really stepped up and, um, and they've been doing great community-based, family-based, meaningful work um, that a lot of arts groups are, you know, showing, uh, you know, rebroadcasting some of their performances and some of those are great to see and it's wonderful to watch uh, Broadway shows online. Um, but we should really be proud of our arts community because they, you know, Cleveland Public Theater, Near West Theater, Lake Erie Inc. Um, city music, our groups are, are really doing more than just putting content up online. They're really engaging with their community. And I think that that, I think that's a real Cleveland response. I think we care about our community and we care about our, our people. And so I think that's why it's more of a family response and why we're feeling that warmth from them. But it's definitely it's definitely going to be tough when you start taking your your audience and your your seating plan in your house and start marking off all the seats that you can't uh, use. Um, 
you're talking about, you know, 20 percent. And that's serious. That's serious. And if that continues a while, um, I don't I don't know if there's enough cornfields to go out in and perform in. Yeah. And Rachel, I think um, another word in addition to pivot is innovation, too. I mean, there has yes. been so much innovation across the board from agencies, large and small. And also there's been some acceleration, too. I mean, we've heard it from our panelists uh, here today about things that maybe had started, but like really ramping up certain things. And so, you know, when I think about kind of the broad community, it it's less about large or small or some of these other factors. It's about what what organizations, what agencies are willing and able to innovate to kind of deal with what's happening right now and, and what may happen in the future. Yeah, and, and you know, Melissa, you mentioned the, that you guys were right on that Friday and having to cancel luncheon. I know those events are huge, not only for you know, really bringing people in and talking about the mission and talking about changes, but also people kind of um, opening themselves up to give and, and understand why they're giving. And, and Sandra, I know with Cleveland Rape Crisis Center, you know, having to cancel something like the Sing Out, which is like near and dear to my heart personally as a choir member, um, just so sad about it being canceled because it was something I always look forward to. Um, because it wasn't maybe just about raising money, it was about just the feeling of getting so many people in a room that cared about something so deeply. Um, but I know from the other side of that, you're looking at a you know a significant chunk of a budget to fill. And you know, in each of your organizations, I know at these at the luncheon of the sing out, you guys are detailing what you do with that money. And so now that you're looking at kind of big holes like that, how do you even start to think about? you know, do I need to cut back services? Can I go somewhere else to get this money? I mean, what is that, what, what's that like? Um, besides losing sleep. <laughs> Sandra, do you wanna go first this time? Sure, yeah, Sing Out uh, was scheduled for June 11th of this year. So when, when the stay at home orders were starting in the middle of March, it didn't even occur to me that we would be thinking that far out. Um, in fact, this week was supposed to be, we we're supposed to start rehearsing this week. Um, and so, yeah, the, after we pivoted to telehealth, the next big decision was, what do we do with Sing Out? And it became quickly apparent that it was not gonna be safe um, to host that event. And I think you're right, Rachel. I think what Sing Out is, it, it is a signature fundraising event for us. And, and the, we have it every other year. Um, it raised a half a million dollars for us last time around. So it is so important to us from a financial perspective. But Sing Out is also an event that invites the community in to experience Cleveland Rape Crisis Center and see what we do for survivors in a way that's really safe and really um, lifts up the voices of survivors. And um, I think it's that sense of community that we're all craving right now that events like Sing Out can, can provide for us. Mm -hmm. um, on the nuts and bolts of it, of how do you replace a half a million dollars in revenue? I mean, the short answer is you don't. Um, it, it's not that we're not being creative and we're not trying, and, but I, I also, um, you know, we are facing, uh, our, our governments are facing budget deficits, so, you know, you, 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 <laughs> you, we can ask, but there's a long line of people asking. We were already facing um, some anticipated cuts from our largest federal funding source at the end of this year. Um, I know philanthropy. Um, I know so many Clevelanders are doing everything they can to step in right now, but others are really suffering right now. And, and philanthropy is, I mean, we're, we're going to see a decrease at some point in time. So you put all of that together and it's, you know, I, you, you don't have a magic wand to just make that go away. Yeah. It was really interesting. I was talking to someone um, that runs like a small foundation the other day, just when I was doing some reporting and they were saying that in their conversation with other foundations and, and philanthropists, um, the urge is to just start giving a ton more money right now, right up front. Um, but all the folks that advise foundations and advise people on giving are saying, you know, keep your, your giving at what it is right now because we really anticipate, you know, next year there needing to be even more giving that the kind of the tail of this where, where the money will really be needed to keep people afloat um, is still a year or two out. Is that kind of what you guys have thought about and are thinking about? 
Yeah, I'm absolutely looking at a two year horizon um, and really concerned. Um, you know, Sandra and I share that federal funding source. And before COVID, we were looking at facing some substantial cuts in this fiscal year. We received a 7% cut. And we know that going into next year, we've been given a heads up that there's going to be another cut and it could be quite significant up to 20%. And I'm sure many of you out there have heard about the United Way's announcement to cut funding by half this year and then next fiscal year, it goes away altogether. So those are two really big hits for us. We're looking at up to uh, $364,000 coming into this budgeting, our next budgeting cycle that we were gonna have to address one way or the other. And now you kind of plot COVID in there and there's the uncertainty of not only where is this going? Is there gonna be a second wave? What are we gonna do with um, housing for folks and you know all of the needs that go along with our clients? But um, what is the economic impact going to be? And what is that trickle effect going to be? So we're really concerned. I mean, we have a short-term problem, we have a long-term, and then we, we're really concerned about that long-term horizon. I mean, uh, communities, especially Cleveland, I was so generous. You know, I've been doing fundraising for a really long time. And, you know, in the wake of emergencies, people respond. They really care. They really see needs and they really respond. And I have all the faith in the world that that instinct and that will continue. But, you know, facing a severe economic recession, there's another thing that's true about Cleveland and a lot of other cities. We do a lot of events. Um, you know, organizations rely a lot on those events. And if our corporate community is not, uh, robust, there's not going to be that same level of philanthropy happening there. So, um, yeah, there are a lot of um, concerns going into this year and even looking out on the horizon. And so is the thought that like, virtual fundraising will be kind of tolerated for now, but it would be very hard to sustain all fundraising in a virtual manner kind of going forward. Right now it's cool, but a year or two from now it might not be cool, right? Exactly. And I think there's some truisms with fundraising, which is, you know, whether it's the, the thing of the day or it's the thing, you know, what is important is relationships and you still, you know, that communication with your donors, making sure that they see the impact that you're having and that they trust you and that you're communicating. As Cynthia talked about that earlier, those, regardless of what type of fundraising you're doing, those are things that you still need to be doing. You know, Emily, I wonder um, if you know of any um, work that's being done to kind of uh, bring together some of the different groups that are all going to be in the same position um, in terms of, you know, um, Center for Community Solutions is always looking at state and federal and what money might be available. And do we have a situation where kind of everybody is on their own trying to, to figure out what the future will be? Or have you heard of any kind of efforts afoot in Cleveland to bring people together to kind of jointly plan for what the needs will be, um, you know, share in some of those efforts to advocate for either money that's needed or, or even, you know, wider conversations about, do we need to consolidate certain things for the time being so that the money gets to where it needs to be right now, but then, you know, people don't go away when the needs, um, you know, expand in the future. Yeah, I think there is some of that happening. Um, a, a lot of what I've heard of is some of the work that the philanthropic community and the foundations are doing to really pool their resources and try and simplify processes and have more of a one, you know, one place to go for COVID response um, type of funding. I don't know how long that will last um, once we pass the kind of immediate immediate need. We are already starting to talk with coalitions of lots of different service providers about the state budget. Um, we've already seen some cuts in this state fiscal year. We're going to need more next state fiscal year. And the next budget process for the next two years is going to be rough. And so, you know, thinking about um, what we don't want to happen is to have, you know, us all competing for the same limited dollars um because then maybe nobody gets funded um and so there's really this kind of triple threat that's happening in terms of of financial sustainability of organizations you know there's the the corporate donations and the event kind of based that that we've touched on already 
there are the foundations because the amount that they have available is tied to the, the market performance of their endowments and of the funds that they have. And so, you know, um, as the stock market goes down, that can have an impact that has a long tail. You know, those bad quarters are with us for usually a couple of years. Um, and then we also have the government funding, right? Tax collections are way down. Um, the state and the county have to balance their budget. They have no choice. Um, and so, you know, all of those revenue sources are really stressed. In the Great Recession, we saw a lot of um, state fiscal relief coming out of Washington to help states balance their budgets a little bit easier. We're not sure if that's going to happen this time around. And so, you know, even organizations with the most diverse revenue streams were sort of seeing threats in, in all directions. I wonder how much do you think um, uh, really matters about what the federal government is doing right now with its unemployment assistance? Um, I've, I've heard from a lot of people that, you know, if not for that additional unemployment assistance, um, people would be in a far different place right now. And in fact, that, you know, families that are often the most vulnerable are are being are able to stay at home right now and stay safer than they would be if they were working and i know that that's going to be just rapidly changing but i keep coming back to that you know just getting money in people's pockets in in terms of survival but there's a there's a sunset on that i mean it's supposed to end in july i don't know what's going to happen um and i wonder if agencies are thinking about what happens in july if that money goes away and how does it change kind of the level of immediate crisis that we have yeah, you know, before this happened, Cleveland was a high poverty city, and we have been for a long time. So the need it is not new to our community, unfortunately. I think we're seeing it to a degree, and it happened so quickly. I mean, so quickly, people lost their income, um, and thousands upon thousands did and are turning to unemployment. So yeah, I mean, it's amazing that that is there for people right now in this emergency, but you are already starting to hear desires to claw it back um, and to kind of return to the way that that these programs and policies worked before, um, which frankly didn't work for a lot of people. And so I, we'll see. Um, there's been a lot, a lot that happened very quickly to make it much easier for people to access help, especially from government. Um, that has not been the trend for the past several years. And so does it all go back to the way it was before? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I've heard from a lot of folks about how um, a lot of bureaucratic burdens and paperwork that before just really made it difficult for people to access service um, were somehow magically lifted, you know, because we didn't want people out, you know, um, standing in line kind of filling out paperwork and things like that. And I wonder if there'll be lessons in that for, um, for service delivery of, you know, the fact that people were able to, um, you know, pay their bills, not have their utilities shut off, maybe not be evicted for a while, and and if there'll be kind of learning points in those. Um, yeah, I mean, services certainly got were streamlined, and so I am starting to hear, you know, some rumblings um, about efficiencies and the efficiencies that those things, you know, which efficiency is something that. Um, public officials love to try and find often in these programs. Um, and so, you know, there, I think that there is a lot of reason for hope um, because we've seen that it can be done, just like I'm hearing from corporations that suddenly we've seen that everyone can be effective working remotely. So maybe we don't need to be as resistant to that change either. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of thinking that's happening. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think immediately folks in the community started talking about was um, our ability to get services to people who are most vulnerable in our community. Um, and I've heard a lot of good things about pe how people not only got, you know, innovative to do that, but um, just groups kind of on the ground, just kind of picking up and figuring out how they could serve people, partnering and working together. Um, and I'm curious, you know, uh, what you guys think about that or what you've seen that you think is hopeful um, in terms of people saying, you know, well, we usually deliver food. Well, we usually do arts programming. Like, what can we do together? Um, and Cynthia, I don't know if you've seen anything cool that where you've seen people. We saw something 
amazingly cool. Um, two of our member groups, uh, NIAC and IRTF, joined together and created a mutual aid group. And um, there's a Facebook page for it. And um, other communities have, have this similar thing. And they've just seen amazing results of people stepping up and identifying, you know, someone from out of town saying that their, their mother needed groceries and someone said, okay, I can go get those groceries and then magically delivering them on someone's back porch. And um, that individual spirit and that individual um, commitment to doing good really you know, really did shine. And um, so I think that's one of, you know, one of those instances where um, it was, it worked out really well. And I think that's going to be something that continues um, to go on. I think um, a lot of our nonprofit people do other things in outside of their jobs. And so taking that information that they have and that they can those things that they care about and doing, stepping up and doing even more has really become evident. And I just wanna remind um, everybody who's still hanging in here, listening in with us, um, if you have questions um, for the panelists or things that you think we should talk about, you know, please mention it in the chat. Um, someone you know, mentioned to remember that there are, um, for small nonprofits, there's funding opportunities through Neighborhood Connections. Um, they are doing some COVID-19 grants. I think there's a lot of um, smaller grants out there in addition to the big you know, COVID-19 response grants that are going to kind of larger organizations that are meeting critical needs right now. Um, one of the conversations that was happening, and I know it was a big um, topic of the, the kind of statewide press conference today, the, the time that we spend with Mike DeWine and Amy Acton now more than we ever thought there would be of spending time with them. Um, and John, who said he's also there. Um, but really talking about racial inequities, and that's a, that's a difficult um, thing, especially in Cleveland, where we've always um, had trouble, you know, really balancing services and making them available to the people that need them both, um, need them most. And also, you know, making sure that the, the staffs of our, you know, nonprofits and people doing the service reflect the communities. And I'm wondering what kind of what conversations are, are happening um, on boards and with funders kind of talking about how, you know, we can use this kind of pause that we've had, although we're all working hard during the pause, to really think harder and think differently um, about how to address some of those inequities that despite some efforts, that have gotten off the ground still remain and still are, are causing, you know, disproportionate harm in our community, especially with, you know, um, with illnesses. And then I think with recovery, we're going to see that even more economic recovery. Yeah, I, I, I'll go first on that. I, I think um, we had a lot of efforts already underway, and we at, at least we have tried to center so many of our decisions and so many of our conversations around the needs of different parts of the community. And, and as we're in the process of reopening our physical offices back up, one of my concerns is about my the employees who work for me. I have an incredibly diverse workforce. And I, I can see trends where different parts of my workforce are more eager to come back to the office than others. And and I, am, I have to be sensitive to that because some of us um, have terrific access to world-class healthcare and, and others do not. And we've, we're seeing tons of research and stories and, and experiences from our neighbors. We're not, there's bias even in, in treatment. Those are, those are very real things that we cannot ignore. So I, I feel it um, in terms of being an employer um, to, to 75 employees first and foremost. We, uh, we have a, what we call equity primes that we use at Cleveland Rape Crisis Center. So when we are having conversations, when we're making decisions, um, we have questions that we ask, you know, how are we centering the needs of communities who have been historically marginalized? And, and we, we try to um, make sure that when we're thinking about how to move forward, how to innovate, how to move to telehealth, that we're, we're thinking about everybody and not just, you know, the people we see right in front of us. 
Yeah, similar here. I mean, I, I'm really hopeful that the disparities that we're seeing right now in the COVID response is going to make it um, a, a more widespread awareness around the, our country that, 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 this, that these disparities are, like, it's very clear. Um, so I hope it brings more awareness to that issue. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen these disparities in our, in our clientele for a, a long time. And, you know, even, um, um, you know, we think about how do we, how do we reach people in the, the best ways. So uh, we think about a lot, our clients a lot who, uh, we work a lot with law enforcement, that there are first responders in domestic violence situations. Well, we have a lot of communities who do not feel safe. They don't feel like they're going to find safety or justice when they call the police. And so that's a big piece of working in a DV environment is people aren't always calling the police. They're turning to natural supports in their communities. So how do we make sure that we have resources there? Um, you know, I think about our Latina clients, you know, they are not coming out for help. They are scared. They are, you know, really scared of interacting with law enforcement. So you know, we're just always really looking at how we make sure that we're deeply present in those communities and have access. And that, that makes me wonder about information, you know, the ways, the best ways right now um, that you guys are learning to reach folks and let them know, um, you know, how they can access services, what what's out there, because I've talked to a number of agencies. Um, I was having a conversation with um, Melanie Shakarian from Legal Aid, and she was saying that they were just constantly trying to figure out new strategies to get to get basic but very important information out to people um, because they they people that they would traditionally reach at the library when they did you know um, a legal you know thing where they where they would answer people's questions they don't have that opportunity um, and she used a phrase and and I know that we we don't need any more forms of poverty in Cleveland. Um, but she said it's, it's information poverty for some people because people who could go to the library and look up things and um, do research can no longer do that. And so I, I'm, I'm curious what we've seen folks doing to, um, to reach, reach people and just make sure that they not only have vital information about where to get food and navigate housing things, but also other services that can, can help keep them safe or help with mental health. I think some of our members and community sharers, we have a, a number of the CDC groups and they've been really stepping up their efforts in terms of their community organizing staff and their outreach staff. Um, several of our members have actually hired new people to do outreach in those communities that don't normally have um, much access to begin with, but in times of crisis like this, they have to really step up their game. So they're actually hiring people, doing more work, um, you know, door to door, block by block. And- Yeah, I thought um, it was interesting that the city of Cleveland also was doing that, that they, instead of laying off their recreation staff, they, they kind of repurpose them as public health information sharers and have them going door to door, leaving you know leaving information on you know health and safety things. I, I thought that was a was an interesting choice um, to keep people employed and and get some vital information out there. Um, have a question from my more hello my how are you doing um, about what organizations are doing for community members that don't have internet access or devices. So if you have folks that you want to serve, um, you know I know that a lot of organizations, especially that um, serve young people. Uh, and if they don't have a device or connectivity, you know, what are the best ways that you can stay engaged? I, for us, that was the urgency around reopening our physical offices. Um, we needed to have a place that, that people could come to. We also, uh, our, our 24 hour rape crisis and support hotline is available via phone, text and online chat. And what we've seen in the last couple of months is that even though our online engagement with website and social media, I mean, the statistics are through the roof, but it's the calls to the hotline that have been going up, um, which I, I find interesting. I think that's it partially could be a connectivity issue. I also wonder if it's just people just need to hear another human voice. Um, 
I know I find myself craving that uh, now and again, um, but it, it is a reversal of the trend we were seeing before this, which was more and more online and texting um, contact and less phone. Mm. Um, I, we have the same things that Sandra is, is saying. We have seen more texts, which has been interesting. We've seen more activity on the text and the web. It kind of depends on for people at home, what's safer, what's a safer place for them to call. You know, we've been really trying to use burner phones. Our, our staff have been trying to connect for folks who we know, they know that their personal phone's not safe. So we're trying to get them those phones. And we've been doing a lot of media, a lot of social media, trying to push out to people in the community that if there's anybody in your life that you're concerned about, now is the time to be checking in with them because isolation is such a insidious part of domestic violence anyway and now that there's forced isolation so you know and it may not be you know show up on the, the door and knock but maybe it is or maybe you have the ability to, to connect with that person and we're really kind of encouraging that kind of personal outreach um, if if we're really concerned about someone who's in a situation where they they cannot reach out either because they don't have access to the technology or you know, they're in a situation where an abuser might be monitoring and preventing them from doing that. I think we're going to see I have a couple more questions. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, I think we're going to see more uh, advocacy and uh, research around this horrible situation that we have with connectivity in some of our communities and the need for um, better broadband, better access to physical devices. Um, I was here at the office one day and I got two calls from people. I don't know why they called us, but um, they needed computers for their kids. And I spent a lot of time trying to help them navigate and find um, the right people to reach out to. I think that's unfortunately a problem a lot of people have. They don't know where to turn to. And so they call just one number that they get a hold of. And if the person <laughs> it made it worthwhile for me to be in the office to be able to tell these two people where to, you know, where to go. And um, now that some things are opening up, I know that there's a big need for um, computers. So I think the PC, is it PCs for people, has been trying to up their game also, but their Slavic Village. I, I don't know if Slavic Village storefront is open yet. Well, you know, and let's not forget about digital literacy as well. You know, devices are one thing, but ability to really use them effectively is, is something else that we're hearing about and concerned about, especially um, when we think about you know, the older population or people that may not be as comfortable, you know, less so with kids. We figure kids can kind of pick up any device, but, you know, there are a lot of people that um, have some challenges and also the kind of uh, safety, online safety, you know, scams are way up for people. And so we don't want to see, you know, those kinds of things happening either. Um, it's a real challenge and a lot of things that we're going to need to think through and think deeply about all of these issues. There's definitely yeah. a lot of work to do. And I hope there's some real learning. You know, like I'm eager, I, I'm like hungry. I don't get to interact with my colleagues as much or in the ways that I used to. And, you know, the United Way Council of Agency Executives is hosting something in a month or so. Um, and one of the breakout topics is how are you connecting with clients right now who may not have access to technology? So I'm really eager to hear what my colleagues have done creatively that we can all learn from each other. Yeah, and Melissa, I'm wondering, and Mai brought this up as well, that, you know, especially with CMSD students, um, who a lot of them were doing learning on paper packets because so many don't have access to devices and so many don't have access to internet. And the district was able to get between, she says, eight and 10,000 units out, it sounds about right, for 38,000 um, students. But in addition, you know, we know that, that kids having contact with teachers is really important when it comes to advocacy for their safety and and um, you know child abuse is something that you know DVCAC also deals with and and I'm a little bit curious as to what are the conversations around that around 
safety and protection for kids who might be at home, might be in some dicey situations, or even, you know, have parents that have to work um, yeah. and they don't have caregivers. And that's really difficult right now. Um, what's the kind of been the conversation around about how we as a community and how child serving agencies are going to be able to look out for the safety of kids, a lot of whom um, people haven't been able to have contact with. I know I was talking to some CMSD teachers and principals who went through the process of trying to call every child. Um, mm -hmm. And they still had about 20% of kids, at least the last time I talked to them, that they had no contact with, mm -hmm. not one call back, not one conversation with the parent. So they, they literally don't, don't know how they're doing. Yeah. Um, have you heard anything about that and what's kind of being done to try to address that need? Yeah, so it's, it's similar in Cleveland to data that we're seeing from across the country, and that is DCFS is seeing a decrease in calls, which is very alarming because, you know, our coaches, our teachers, our school counselor, they were eyes and ears that were noticing, and they were noticing those signs of abuse and making those reports, those mandated reporters, and now they're not. And um, DCFS, if everybody is aware, they are allowing people to report concerns on their face via Facebook and online. Um, so that's something that people have access to, but it's still the issue is that people don't have eyeballs on these kids. So I, I say the same, if there was any child that you were concerned about before going into COVID, if there's any way that you have the ability to check in and, and see how that family is doing, it's a really important time to do that. But um, our Child Advocacy Center is open. We're doing forensic interviews um, because there are still reports being made and there are, you know, so we're still doing that piece of it, but we just really are concerned that there's a whole lot of kids out there who aren't um, being brought to the attention. And we're preparing for when summer camps do open, when kids are going back to daycares, when we, they do start to go back to these places, we're really anticipating and preparing for those numbers to go way up. And so there's gonna be, we expect that there will be a wave of, of need for those services in the, the coming months. Yeah, I think we're gonna be feeling the effects of this for a very long time. Uh, reports to Cleveland Police Department sex crimes reports have been going down and we are, have been just dramatically low in the past couple months. We're seeing that trend sort of across our, across our service area. But we, we also got some calls um, in the last three, two months in our hotline, they said, you know, this happened, I was assaulted, I'm not going to an emergency department because I'd rather deal with the effects of my assault or get an STD or whatever it may be than go to the hospital and end up with coronavirus. Um, so I think people delayed reaching out for help, they delayed care, and I think that then the consequences are even greater. Um, from a mental health perspective, from a physical health perspective, um, and, and I, I think for years we're going to be seeing the effects of this. Kind of speaking I, about I, longer term. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I just I couldn't agree more with what Sandra's saying, and and not to um, bring another downer um, concept to the table. But you know, we're also people are um, we're concerned that um, police may not be making arrests in every situation where they may have otherwise uh, because of the jails wanting to be uh, releasing people from the jails. It's that's a big concern right now too. Yeah, it's Melissa, it's kind of like you were saying, you guys got shoved off a ledge in March and we're going to be climbing a very steep mountain for the next couple of years to try to sort out what we need to do um, from this time in which we weren't able to respond quite the way we wanted to. Um, also speaking about long term effects, um, there's a, a message in the chat, which I'm not surprised by at all because this has been a real shocking thing for me. Um, so few people are filling out their census. Mm. And I wonder, you know, especially here in Cleveland, everyone's like, oh my gosh, you know, um, people that realize this is how decisions are made about where federal money goes and then where then state money goes are just screaming um, from every rooftop they can um, about filling out the census because, you know, even, um, you know, domestic violence services, all those kind of services when people are looking at federal grants somehow census calculations can get in there you know how many people do you serve you know what is their status everything like that um and emily i'm guessing that you might be the most equipped to talk a little bit about this um but how do you kind of handle those concerns besides the many 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 posts from your colleagues telling everybody <laughs> to fill out the census 
Um, are there any other strategies or things that you've heard about? I, I was at an, I was at a um, volunteering the other day and people were handing out census bags, you know, very desperately trying to convince people to, and asking them whether they had filled it out. Um, but do you know of anything else that's going on, any kind of larger efforts so that we can uh, get folks counted? Yeah, I mean, if anyone listening hasn't done your census yet, do it, <laughs> do it and do it now. Um, yeah, you know, one of the challenges is that June was, May and June were meant to be times when that the outreach, the in-person outreach started to happen. You know, there are phases of census. And so we usually, we don't expect to see that many people filling it out on their own, but there are all these plans that are planned for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> to to try and reach, you know, they're, they're called the hard to reach populations um, or hard to count populations uh, that really had to be canceled or delayed. Um, and the further we get from April 1st, you know, if you're supposed to talk about where you, your normal place that you were living on April 1st is what we're supposed to be counting. And the further away we get from there, um, the bigger concern about, you know, the accuracy of the data and the information. Um, but yeah, you know, there were big plans that were to happen in Cleveland to do a bunch of door knocking that had to be canceled and trying to figure out how do we connect the libraries are a huge place where a lot of census taking happens. Um, and with libraries closed, it's just one more thing that's that's a little bit harder. Um, many of my colleagues at the Center for Community Solutions are very engaged in, in efforts to try and ensure people, you know, that, that the census is safe. It is, you know, it's information that can't be shared with other agencies and, and um, some other concerns, but it is, it is a huge concern. And uh, Ohio is one of not very many states that have a constitutional requirement that has a date in it for when um, reapportionment has to happen. And some of the plans that the Census Bureau is putting out because they're delaying things, hoping to kind of buy some time. Um, we're going to be right up against that deadline in Ohio. So it's it's political representation, it's funding, it is understanding who lives in our community, it's making sure that we do all count. Um, it's so easy to fill out <laughs> to fill out the census, and so you know, uh, really trying to be creative and and reaching people. A lot of it is still in person, even in our digital age, and that hasn't been able to happen. What, what do you think is preventing people from um, participating? You know, I feel like a lot of people are at home, um, you know, look on social media and stuff like that. Are there specific barriers that have been identified um, that are different now, or is it really the same problems, but just less in-person outreach available? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. I think that there are some of the same, you know, the same things that um, are always a problem. Um, you know, we're all getting a lot of direct mail and sometimes it's harder to tell what's like legit and, and what may be um, not so legitimate. And so I think that that is a lot of what's happening. You know, I'm hearing from my friends that do polling that they are, everybody's answering the phone and everyone wants to answer all the questions. So like those response rates are so high these days, I think because people are at home and want that, that human touch. So, it, you know, some of it, really um, is a little boggling. You know, you would think that that some of the excuses we hear about people being too busy um, may have kind of turned around, but I think it's just, it, it's the same sort of relationship. You know, people are cut off from their, their trusted advisors that would be normally telling them, this is a good thing to do. Have you done it yet? Let's sit down together and do it. You know, just like the services that everyone on the panel is talking about too. It's just one, an additional example of what that kind of isolation can mean. Well, Julie in the chat says that they did the census with their nine-year-old son as a civics and genealogy lesson, which that's totally awesome. And I think that so many of us parents with kids at home are learning that we can turn a lot of things into lessons, whether it's <laughs> making dinner or doing the census, um, trying to find a lot of ways to do um, learning while also accomplishing other things. Um, so I think we're kind of coming up on a little over an hour now, and I want to make sure that um, at the end of this, we remember to give each of you kind of a chance to let people know how they can um, support your agencies. But one, one last question that I wanted to ask is I know that, you know, your agencies all have staff and the different nonprofits have staff and they often do just 
so much work that is not seen, you know, it's all, all those of us on this glamorous panel are seen and, and they're not. And I'm just curious, you know, how are your staffs doing and how you guys are trying to care for the, their well being? Because I, I think it can be just incredibly difficult to not only be caring for your own family and their needs, but also doing direct services for folks that um, either have, you know, experienced trauma, are unsafe. Or, or have, have needs that are, are being met. And so I would just like to, to hear a little bit about that, whether how you're caring for them or, or how they're faring, or maybe even something happy that, <laughs> that you're able to do to kind of keep them afloat in this time. Well, I'll, it's, it's really a challenging time. I'm not gonna lie. You know, the staff, we're in a trauma-informed environment. People re rely on each other. They rely on having the support of each other. And now they're, apart from each other. So staying connected when you're apart is a challenge. Being worried about your clients when you don't have the same ability to interact and then dealing with whatever you're doing in your family. I think, you know, and we have, we spend so much time on trauma and vicarious trauma and self-care. And I've noticed myself, you know, our self-care kind of partly right now is to say to staff, like, it's okay to not feel okay right now. Like, it's just okay. Be the mess that you are and do what you need to do in the moment. And that's hard. It's really hard for staff because they want to be there for each other. They want to be there for their clients. So uh, what we're really finding is, you know, things that were challenging for us before, things that were strengths for us before are kind of exacerbated. Um, but uh, we have this, uh, we, we have a mascot. Our mascot is a hedgehog. They kind of roll up into a protective little ball and they're cute. And for whatever reason, that was chosen as our mascot. So we have a hedge committee and they just have been amazingly fantastic with uh, you know, the Friday fun question, the empower playlist, the, you know, send the picture of your furry workmate and, you know, just the things that continue to help us stay connected. And we've just done things with flexible leave and flexible, you know, loosening up our user lose vacation policies. I mean, we're just looking for everywhere we can to support staff as they try to manage their lives right now. And, and so, so much of that is true for us as well. I think when I look back on this time, I think what one of the things that will stand out most for me are the employees we have that were not necessarily people that I would have expected, but in a moment of crisis, they are the ones that just went above and beyond and did incredible things. And it's been, um, it's been inspiring as a leader to keep to see people like they didn't ask permission if they could do something. They just did it, and and that's I think that's how we keep pushing the envelope and keep getting better. Um, I am always concerned about about the team and and how they're faring, um, but I think. Uh, um, we've been sharing a lot more communication at all levels, up, down, sideways, and we are sharing a lot more client success stories because I think that's mm -hmm. what people need to hear right now. They need to hear that the work we do really does matter, and the more we can remind people, um, you know, it just gives you a little bit more inspiration to keep going. Yeah, and one of the things, um, kind of one of the bright spots that came out in the survey that we did conduct is that most people said that um, they have access to paid sick leave through their employer, you know, of direct service providers. They have paid vacation and paid time off. They have access to assistance, mental health counseling through employee assistance programs. So, you know, some of those kind of like workplace best practices that seem to be a struggle for um, some other agencies, you know, a lot of people have access to them. And one thing that really struck me um, from the survey is that the respondents were more than twice as likely to say that they were very concerned for the well-being or mental health of their clients than they were for their own well-being. And so there is a lot of um, an incredible amount of thinking of others and really, you know, thinking about the clients and a lot of the, the weight that comes from that as well. Worrying, you know, we worry about ourselves, we worry about those that we love, but we're worrying about the whole community <laughs> at the same time. And so, you know, a lot of very selfless people who have absolutely stepped up in this time of real crisis and should be applauded. Well, that seems like a pretty good note to end on unless there's some, some burning questions. 
Um, I really appreciate you guys for taking time um, after working all day <laughs> for coming and, and participating on this panel. Um, I'm really grateful for the Shaker Heights chapter of the League of Women Voters for, for continuing to have these conversations that we would be having in person, um, probably at a library um, where we'd be spending time together and, and talking and networking after. So um, hopefully those of you who are in this room, even if you can't see each other, continue to have conversations about this and also um, continue to support the nonprofits in the community. They're doing really good work. Um, and I just wanted to give you guys each a chance if you, if you, um, those of you who are doing some of your virtual fundraising, if you wanna just talk about for a second before we leave, if there's any specific things you guys are doing that you wanna let people know um, if they wanna either donate or um, participate in any kind of actions that you have, uh, you could each take a couple of minutes and let folks know, and then we will go uh, hopefully take a walk outside and enjoy the rest of this beautiful night. There's a good sunset that's about to happen. I can see out one of my windows. Well, I would say for my line has been, not everyone right now is in a position to give but those of us who are in a position, it's incumbent upon us to do more. Um, you know, Cleveland Rape Crisis Center relies on donations of all sizes um, that keep our operations going day in and day out. And while we never expect any gifts, we always appreciate them. And my team might not um, appreciate that I might say there's some kind of maybe possible virtual sing out campaign that may be coming on the horizon. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> we won't. We won't tell. Okay. Um, I guess you know. For us, it, very the same. Um, we are. Um, you know, individual donations are so key and so critical because they tend to be unrestricted, and that is the mo that's just like the most important money we have because it just allows us to do what we need to do. Um, we have an Amazon wish list. We need a lot of stuff to run the shelter and to run the child advocacy center. So there's a wish list if you want to give things. Um, and it's fun. We've been getting Amazon boxes delivered like at a lovely pace. So that's been wonderful. We've had some folks call and say, hey, I'm a sewer. You know, I've got a whole bunch of cloth. Can we make you some masks? So we are needing, we're going through masks quickly um, with our services. So any and all of those are greatly appreciated. Um, you know, we were planning to announce our name change at the event, which we completely um, postponed because we want people to not be confused right now about who we are and where to find us. But, um, you know, if, at some point, we will likely be doing some sort of a virtual announcement of a, a new name. So just be aware of that. If you suddenly hear about this other organization that's doing domestic violence, it's, it's probably us. <laughs> Thank you for your time tonight. Yeah, and I would suggest um, any any folks that have suggestions of what to give or Amazon wish lists or donations. Um, this is being live streamed on Facebook, so it'd probably be a good idea to go into the comments and like drop in a link, so people know how to find you to help with the things they're talking about or that you're talking about. And Cynthia, did you have any suggestions for? the different members of your organization, how people can um, get in touch with them more globally if need be, or if they have the inclination to join in. I saw that you dropped the mutual aid link in there or somebody did. So that's somebody else did. People I don't know who that, that was. Um, yeah. um, thank you. Um, well, the whole concept of community shares was born 35 years ago because um, they wanted to work together. And so, um, the beauty is that if you've got a dollar or you've got a thousand dollars, you can give it to community shares and we divide it up for general unrestricted support 40 different ways, including the Domestic Violence and Child Advocacy Center yes. as a member, yes. yay. yay. Um, so there's a charity for all of, all of your interests between animals like the APL and Friends of Cleveland Kennel. Um, to our CDCs and to some of the healthcare organizations and researchers like Policy Matters Ohio um, and the arts group. So a little bit of money can go a long way and we all bring it together. So um, it's communityshares.org. We also have a Facebook page. Um, so we'd love to um, tell you more about our members and you can always email me or check in on the 
as I said, on the Facebook page. Um, but we're all about the collaboration and we're, we wanna find something that, some way to help you be philanthropic, even if you have a dollar because our dollars all add up. Thanks. Yeah, and I think um, a great, from the perspective <laughs> of the Center for Community Solutions, just visit our website for more information. Um, and we do every year a Most Treasured Volunteer Award and nominations are gonna be opening up soon. So as you're paying attention to the great things that are happening in the community, kind of keep those in your mind for when it comes time to recognize um, volunteers across the community. That's going to be a good competition this year because I, I see I so many so. people in our community are just putting in so much volunteer out, so many volunteer hours with the time that they have, you know, folks who've been off work have, have been out there helping people. So um, once again, I appreciate everybody who kind of tuned in and listened um, on Facebook and also here um, who registered and came in on the Zoom call, one of many, many Zoom calls I'm sure that we're all on. Um, it'll be the summer of Zoom. Um, so thank you for joining us. And if you have any other questions, you can put them in those comments on Facebook and I will check them out and try to see if I can get some answers. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.